All right, today we look at cell structure and our desired results, aka learning objectives, are that you should be able to explain the role of the cell nucleus. You should also be able to identify the cellular structures that make and transport proteins and other macromolecules. You should also be able to distinguish the functions of vacuoles, lysosomes, and the cytoplasm and compare the roles of chloroplasts and mitochondria. Lastly, you should be able to describe the role of a cell membrane. Very, very important. All right, so here we have representations of the plant and animal cells, and these are going to be commonly used, uh, these illustrations, throughout the lesson. And as each of the different cellular components gets discussed, you're going to see uh, the image be highlighted uh, so that you can recognize the components. All right, so the nucleus, we're going to start there. The nucleus controls uh, most of the cell processes, and of course it contain, contains DNA. Uh, in fact, it contains almost all of the cell's DNA. It doesn't con contain it all, but almost all of it. And with that and the coded instructions for making proteins uh, are included in that DNA. Uh, it also has instructions for making other very important molecules. And by contrast, prokaryotic cells lack a nucleus. Their DNA, rather, is... Uh, containing the same kinds of instructions, but it's just found floating around inside the cytoplasm. So here we have the nuclear envelope. That's the outside of the nucleus. Uh, it's kind of similar to the cell membrane itself. And uh, it is similar in that it has a double layered membrane barrier. And that barrier protects the DNA. Now, in the, uh, in the DNA, we have, or on the uh, nuclear envelope, we have nuclear pores. And these pores are basically tiny little holes or ports in the envelope uh, that uh, allow certain components to enter and leave the nucleus. We also find inside of the nucleus, inside the nuclear envelope, chromatin. And this is the uncoiled DNA. It's just another name for DNA, but it gives us a sense of its structure or its uh, how it's uh, organized uh, at a particular time. Uh, so as it's kind of just hanging out doing nothing, it's all uncoiled and we call it chromatin. Uh, we also find proteins amongst the chromatin, which helps keep it from getting all tangled up. And the form of, uh, and, and so this is basically just the form of DNA when it's not condensed into a chromosome. Okay, and lastly, inside of the nuclear envelope, we have the nucleolus. And this is kind of a specific area within the nucleus where ribosome assembly initiates. So uh, ribosomes we're going to learn about here shortly. Uh, ribosomes are made in the nucleolus. All right, so proteins are very important. They carry out most of the essential functions of living things. Uh, this includes synthesizing other macromolecules like lipids and carbohydrates. Um, and a big part of the cell is devoted to the production and distribution of proteins. Uh, this is a large picture, and uh, we're going to see it uh, here for a little bit. And we're going to see it in its entirety here shortly, uh, but we're going to see portions of it as we kind of progress through this information. So, <clears throat> this as I'm going to ask you some questions, and of course they're rhetorical, meaning you don't have to answer them, but do think about it as you're watching this video. Think about what... Think about the questions and, and maybe what your answers are. And I'm going to give you the answers, of course. If you want to think about it a little longer, you can always push pause and uh, give it some more thought. Maybe jot down some of your thoughts or ideas of what it might be. And then compare that to what I uh, tell you about the question, what, what the answer is. So the first question I would have is, um, 
what happens first? So we see the nucleolus, and we see a rough endoplasmic reticulum. We see ribosomes and proteins. We see smooth endoplasmic reticulum. All of these, uh, all of these items we see uh, in this illustration. Nucleolus. Right here. We've got the endoplasmic reticulum. That's all these little uh, maze-like structures. We have smooth endoplasmic reticulum over here. We have uh, vesicles being formed uh, containing proteins. We've got ribosomes engaging with proteins for some reason. We're going to learn about that. And then the protein seems to enter into the rough endoplasmic reticulum and, and so forth and so on. So what do you think happens first? Well, it might be that you're noticing that a protein is coming off of the ribosome and uh, we're just going to be able to pretty much follow that protein because this is all about the organelles that build proteins. So ribosomes are very small particles of what we call RNA. It's a form of DNA. Uh, but it's not exactly the same. And we'll talk about the differences at some point. Uh, but just know that, that ribosomes are small particles of RNA. And they also have some proteins in them. And they're found throughout the cytoplasm in all cells. And ribosomes, their job is to assemble proteins by following coded instructions that come from the DNA. So what happens next? What do you think? You can pause if you want to think about that for a moment. But likely you're going to notice that the protein gets fed into the rough endoplasmic reticulum. We see that happening right around in this area here. So again, first we have proteins being assembled on ribosomes. And then some of those proteins complete their assembly on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now, proteins um, that are targeted for export to the cell membrane or to specialized locations within the cell, they complete their assembly on ribosomes bound to the rough ER, which is what makes the rough ER rough. Those ribosomes that are embedded in the, in the uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum are why we call that portion of endoplasmic reticulum rough. And that's basically the main difference between what we call smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which you see over here, which has no ribosomes, and the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which you, if you look, you do see um, ribosomes embedded within those structures on the rough. All right, so what happens next? Well, what you might notice is that the uh, proteins are carried from the rough endoplasmic reticulum and they actually go to what we call the Golgi apparatus. Um, and, but they're, they're basically uh, uh, packaged into these things called vesicles. And that's where they're taken to the Golgi apparatus, which we haven't been introduced to yet. So let's take a look at the Golgi apparatus. So as we're going through all of these different organelles within the uh, within the cell, you're going to notice that we're kind of following the path that a protein takes from origination point with the ribosomes all the way through to being uh, sent out of the cell to some other place in the body or some other location within the cell. And that's important. Uh, the whole point of these organelles is to do this very thing, to build proteins. So that's why we're following the proteins. And as we follow the path that proteins take, uh, that will introduce us to all of these various organelles. Not all of them, but most of them. At least the ones involved in protein building. All right, so here we have the vesicle uh, from the previous illustration. And it's moving towards the Golgi apparatus, as we mentioned before. So the vesicle will then uh, fuse with the Golgi apparatus and the Golgi apparatus will then modify or sort or package the proteins and other materials or do all of those things actually um, 
and even other materials, not just proteins. They'll do this with other materials as well. Um, but all of these materials are coming from the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum. So that begs the question, what happens next? Well, as I said, the Golgi apparatus sorts and packages as proteins, and then those proteins uh, are put into another vesicle, a new vesicle, and they're shipped to their final destination. And that can be either inside the cell or it might be outside of the cell. All right, so now we see that whole process shown here uh, in this slide. And uh, basically, uh, the question becomes, where are proteins assembled? Well, the answer to that question is in the ribosomes. Okay. So what can you infer about a cell that is packed with more than the typical number of ribosomes? Well, you might think that if a cell has more than the typical number of ribosomes, then maybe that particular cell produces more proteins than other cells do. Remember that cells specialize. And so some cells specialize in creating proteins, lots and different, lots of different kinds of proteins. So a cell that is involved in creating lots and lots of proteins might have a uh, higher than average number of ribosomes because that's what gets this thing kicked off in terms of building proteins. All right, so where is the synthesis of membrane proteins completed? Well, the answer to that question is in the endoplasmic reticulum. And how do the proteins get transported to the Golgi apparatus? Well, they get packaged into a vesicle. And then the question is, where does it go from there? What happens to the proteins? after they go through the Golgi apparatus and are leaving the Golgi apparatus? Well, they're sent out of the cell or they're, they're sent back into the cytoplasm to be used either by another organelle or for some other reason. Now, something you might wanna do just for your own benefit is to create a flow chart like the one you see here and kind of summarize the role of each of the following cellular structures in protein synthesis. The nucleus, the nuclear envelope, ribosomes, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, vesicles, vacuole, and cell membrane. By the way, we didn't really say much about vacuoles, but... Uh, They're very similar to vesicles. All right. So there are different types of vacuoles that exist. And we're going to take a look first at the plant, uh, a special kind of vacuole we find in plant cells and it is called the central vacuole. So generally, plants will have one of these large central vacuoles. They're very large, although uh, the size will change depending on how much water is in the cell. So when you find a plant that's uh, growing very strong and sturdy, it looks very healthy, it's because it has plenty of water uh, in it. Uh, mainly in the, in the uh, central vacuole of each of its cells. But when a plant begins to get kind of wilted and look kind of weak and fragile and soft, uh, that's when it's lacking water. The central vacuole doesn't have much water in it, so it's like a balloon. And if it isn't filled with something, like think about water balloons in the summer and you have a water balloon fight. Have you ever done that? I'm sure probably all of you have. Uh, It'll get smaller if, if it doesn't have enough water in it. It'll be smaller. If it has a lot of water in it, of course, it's going to get bigger. So if, it's, if the central vacuole is small, it doesn't have much water in it, the plant begins to droop and get very uh, wilty, wilted looking. But if you give that plant some water at its root system, uh, it will, within a few hours, uh, refill those, vac those central vacuoles and the plant will get 
upright again. All right, so now let's take a look at the paramecium, which is this little jammy right up here. And it, too, has a, con uh, a vacuole, a specialized vacuole. And it's called a contractile vacuole. And this is how the paramecium regulates how much water it has inside uh, itself. Okay, so paramecium's are single-celled organisms. Uh, so they're completely uh, one cell, that's it. Uh, but these, the contractile vacuole uh, allows this paramecium to expel water if it, if it has a little bit too much or to take in water if it needs more. And so that is kind of how, uh, one of the ways that the paramecium maintains homeostasis, which we've talked about being one of the essential functions of a cell in order to uh, continue being lively. So there are also smaller vesicles that function to both store and to transport materials within the cell. They also help transport materials to and from the external cellular environment outside of the cell. Vesicles transport materials to the cell membrane in particular. So why do you think it's important that cells transport materials using vesicles rather than just having those materials uh, move to whatever location they need to go to on their own? Well, the vesicles keep the materials segregated from, one, from other materials in the cell, uh, keeps it nice and tidy, all contained, and prevents things from interacting with it that should not. Okay? If it were to start interacting with other things in the cell, it might not be available to do what it was made to do. Okay. All right. So there are these other organelles called lysosomes and they, their job is to break down lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins into small molecules. And then those smaller molecules can be used by the rest of the cell. And lysosomes are also involved in breaking down organelles that have basically outlived their usefulness. Basically, they're all worn out. So the lysosome breaks them down. Now, imagine if the, uh, your cell was making proteins but didn't package those proteins into vesicles. Well, those lysosomes could break down those proteins. So all the work that your cell did to create those proteins is thrown out. Uh, because of uh, because of the uh, the lysosomes breaking down the proteins. All right, so here we have um, what we see is some cells here. We have uh, all of these weird wiggly line looking things. Well, all uh, all cells all cells have a very extensive network of filaments in the cytoplasm. And these filaments make up what we call the cytoplasm. Microfilaments are the pale purple ones. You can kind of see them kind of on the edges and kind of almost like they're in the background. Uh, but there's a lot of them. And uh, those are the microfilaments. They're very small. A little bit larger, we have the microtubules. Those are the yellow items that you see there. And they're two of the principal protein filaments that make up the cytoskeleton of a cell. They kind of give the cell some structure. Not that the cell can't change shape, um, but this does gives, give the cell some structure so it doesn't get crushed too easily. The microfilaments, those purple things, uh, these are like thread-like structures, and they're made up of a protein that we call actin, A-C-T-I-N. And they basically form a very extensive network uh, in, in a lot of cells. And they produce a pretty tough, flexible framework that supports the cell, as I was saying before. Uh, it does allow them to uh, be a little bit malleable, but it does give them some support so that there's room within the cell for all the organelles to do the things that they have to do. Microfilaments, on the other hand, well, not really on the other hand. They're kind of similar. They have a similar role, um, but they uh, are a little more mobile, and they actually help the cell to move. So the cytoskeleton not only forms the cell's shape 
and, and a framework for the shape of the cell, but it also acts like a highway in the cell, moving materials and organelles to the appropriate locations. What I mean by that is that there are cellular components um, and they're not random, right? They're, they're a combination of things that are floating around in the cell, but they're actually placed very deliberately in very strategic areas and they're moved along specific pathways if they need to move to another area. In fact, at some point this year, I will be showing you a video that shows proteins moving other, uh, other, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Other objects around the cell by walking on these microfilaments as if they're some kind of a track or a highway. Pretty cool stuff. So the microtubules now, these were the yellow things in the previous image, they're hollow structures and they're made up of proteins known as tubulins. The microfilaments were actins. Now we've got the microtubules made up of tubulins. And in many cells, they play critical roles in maintaining that cell shape, which I've mentioned a couple times. Microtubules form the mitotic spindle, uh, which is, we're going to learn about that when we start talking about cell division. Now, in animal cells, there are these things called centrioles that are also formed from the tubulins. Centrioles we don't find in plants, though. They're only found in animal cells and in human cells. All right, so microtubules also help build projections from the cell's surface known as cilia and flagella. So when we come across some organisms that have cilia and or flagella, they're actually made out of microtubules. So what we're looking at here is a cross-section of a flagellum, and it shows the 9 plus 2 arrangement of microtubules. 9 plus 2, what am I talking about? Well, there's one here, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 here, and then there's two here. So there's nine purple filaments, and there's two blue filaments. They're the same thing. They're just colored differently to help us see them uh, within this particular cell. Okay, all right there in the middle. All right, so let's move on to chloroplasts. Uh, we only find chloroplasts in plant cells uh, and some other organisms like algae, and there's some bacteria that have chloroplasts too. Uh, they're, photo, uh, they're, they're able to pr produce energy through uh, photosynthesis, so they're photosynthetic. Uh, but animals and humans do not contain chloroplasts. So do you guys remember what photosynthesis is? I'm sure you learned about it in a science class at some point along the way. Um, but uh, when we think about photosynthesis, the chloroplasts, you could, you could kind of refer to them as the solar collectors, right? Like if you think about uh, solar panels on the roof of a house, uh, th these would be the chloroplasts, right? And uh, basically in photosynthesis, plants take that solar energy that it collects in the uh, chloroplasts and, uh, and they convert that into food molecules. So it goes from solar energy to chemical energy. Okay. Basically, when I say food molecules, by that I mean sugars. Now, both plants and animals then take this food, these sugars, and they break them down to access energy for cellular activities. And that energy is stored in a molecule named ATP. Once the, uh, well, where does the ATP come from? Well, the sugars that are produced um, either through digestion in animals and humans or through the chloroplasts work in plants, those sugars then go to the mitochondria. Because all cells need this energy in order to carry out almost all of their processes. Okay, but the form that that energy takes has to be very specific, right? It can't just use the energy found in the sugar molecules. It needs to convert that energy into a, a storage molecule. And again, that is the ATP. So cellular respiration is what we call the conversion of energy from uh, chemical energy into a form that cells can use. All right. So those food molecules, those sugars, 
um, get converted into a form that the cells can use. And that's the job of mitochondria, to carry out cellular respiration. So uh, why do we call the mitochondria the powerhouses of the cell? Well, it's because they're the organelle that's responsible for making energy available from food to fuel all the cellular activities that are going on. So some of you might think that mitochondria are only found in animal cells and that chloroplasts are only found in, in plant cells. But the mitochondria are actually found in nearly all eukaryotes, so all organisms that have a membrane-bound nucleus, um, and that includes plants. All right, so think about a meal that you've recently eaten and uh, see if you can trace it back to photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So let's say, what did I have for lunch today? I had lunch, I had a fish sandwich with uh, zucchini relish on it. And the zucchini relish it also had some tomatoes and some onion straws. And those are all plants. And those plants produced sugars while they were living uh, and their chloroplasts were working. So I got my sugars to use in my mitochondria from eating those plants. Hmm. So it's all connected. So even though we don't have chloroplasts uh, in our cells, uh, we still benefit from the existence of chloroplasts in plant cells. So it's all connected. We're all connected. All right, so what do you think happens when a property owner puts up a fence? What purpose does the fence serve? How do people get in and out if there's a fence there? Are there different kinds of fences? Well, you're probably thinking, well, Duh, a fence keeps people and animals out of the yard. It also ke can keep people from leaving the yard and animals as well, right? You might have a fence to keep your dog in. Well, people uh, enter and exit uh, through the fences using a gate. And I'm sure you've probably seen lots of different types of fences. Well, a cell's contents are also kind of contained or confined within a barrier. And of course, we call that a cell membrane. But there's also this thing called a cell wall. So my question is this, which cells have cell walls and where are, where are the cell walls located in cells? Well, the answer to that question is that plant cells and prokaryotes have cell walls. And they are located on the outside of the cell membrane. So knowing that, would you say it's true or false that all cells have a cell membrane? Well, if you are thinking true, you are thinking correctly. All cells have cell membranes. Little eukary or little prokaryotes, like the uh, friendly little uh, amoeba we have here, or whatever that is. Uh, animal and human cells have a cell membrane. We see that uh, in the yellow here. And we also have a cell membrane inside of the cell wall of plant cells. And the prokaryotes also have a cell wall and a cell membrane inside of it. Okay, so here we see the cell walls. All right. All right, so the cell membrane is basically in charge of regulating what comes in and what leaves the cell, and it also protects and supports the cell, of course. Now, we, were, we use the analogy of a fence that has gates that allows things to come in and out of the fence. But I like to think of it as a bouncer at a club, right? Anybody ever go clubbing? You're probably a little too young for that. Um, but when you go to a club, there might be a bouncer at the door. And his job is to let in the people and take people out that are no longer welcome because of uh, acting up or whatever the case may be. They also let people out when, it, when they uh, want to leave. Um, but the membrane uh, only allows certain things to cross it. So we call cell membranes semi-permeable for this very reason, because it's semi-permeable. If it was fully permeable, Things would be able to come and go as they please. 
but it's not, so it can't. So look carefully at the picture of the membrane here. And notice that the inside and the outside, they have a lot of labels. Uh, we've got, in fact, it is actually labeled inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. We kind of need to keep that straight uh, because we have things like carbohydrate chains, things like that, that stick out on the outside of the cell, but not through in, into the inside of the cell. All right, so just no, make a note of that. So what we're looking at here is a very small portion of uh, the cell membrane. Okay, this is what uh, we're looking at. Basically, this little square up here, that's the portion of the cell membrane that is illustrated here. So a very small portion. And then we also have this whoosh here. I don't know what, what to call that, but it's like a whoosh that basically magnifies uh, a portion of the cell membrane to show us what the cell membrane is made out of. So as you can see, it's called a lipid. It's actually, the technical term is phospholipid. And this uh, cell membrane, you notice there is a layer of phospholipids on the bottom, on the inside of the cell, and there's a layer of phospholipids on the outside of the cell. That means that it's bilayered. So it's a phospholipid bilayer membrane. Okay, This lipid is a phospholipid. But the general term is a lipid. And lipids are also what we call fats. So when you think about Oil, cooking oils, butter, those kinds of things, they're all fats, um, but technically they're called lipids. Okay. Now the lipids are, uh, they have two sides to them, you can tell. Uh, there's a tail on one side and we call this the head on the other side. And what we have learned is that the heads of lipids are hydrophilic, meaning that they love water. So they're attracted to water. But the hydrophobic tails are hydrophobic, meaning they are scared of water. They don't like water. They don't get along with water. And this is exactly why fats, so oils and water, don't mix, right? When you combine vegetable oil and water together, they separate. And it's because of these hydrophobic tails on the lipid molecules. Well, when you take a, uh, a phospholipid bilayer where you have two layers of these lipids with the tails both pointing inwards towards each other. Uh, now you can imagine when water is passing through the membrane, um, which it can pass through because it's a small enough molecule, uh, once it gets to the inner part of the membrane, it's basically getting pushed away uh, by the, the hydrophobic tails of those phospholipids. That causes the water to uh, go either into the, into the cell or out of the cell. All right now, also keep in mind that the, these phospholipids kind of float around and they kind of pass each other, and they're not always in the same position. That can change uh, as they kind of slide around. They're not connected to each other, but they're kind of they kind of stick together. There's some uh, chemical chemistry going on there that kind of helps them stick together, but they will move around and pass each other. Uh, and this is what we call the fluid mosaic model, where they're able to really move and kind of slide past each other, which allows them to kind of change shape and, and that kind of thing. So that's why if you ever hear the term uh, a fluid mosaic, that's what they're talking about. All right, so here we have the lipids. We already talked about those. We've got membrane proteins as well. And these are basically proteins that are stuck into the membrane. And they actually uh, provide assistance to molecules that are too large to fit through the semi-permeableness of the phospholipid bilayer. Uh, they basically create a channel that allows other molecules to pass through or pass out of the cell, pass into the cell or pass out of the cell. All right, and then we also have these carbohydrate chains. 
And they are basically attached to the proteins and they act kind of as flags that identify the cell in some specific manner. We'll learn more about carbohydrate chains uh, as we move through the next couple chapters. Um, but this is just kind of a quick introduction to that. So I hope you got a lot out of this uh, program. And uh, yeah. So take some notes, read through chapter 8.2 in your online textbook, and uh, we'll see you in class. Thank you.